Good afternoon. My name is Song Wu. I'm a senior student uh, at UCI study business economics. And I'm the co-director of today's final panel discussion on real estate titled China's Surging Investment and Development in the U.S. Real Estate Market, Opportunities, Risks, and the Diversified Strategies. The United States has long served as a beacon for foreign investments and business opportunities. With a strong economy, increasingly favorable exchange rate, and opportunities for diversification, greater capital flow from China has been entering into the U major U.S. real estate markets, such as New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Our panelists will review the models and strategies for real estate development and investment, and in examine the successful stories of various real estate initiatives. Our panelists will also share their thoughts on the sector's future opportunities and challenges. Today, we are very honored to have the distinguished speakers come to our panels, and they are Feng Feng, the co-founder and managing partner of U.S. China Real Estate Investment Center, and Wei Huang, the manager of acquisition from LT Global Investment, uh, Ting Ting Han, managing director of Beijing Construction and Engineering Group in the U.S. operations, and Skip Whitney, the executive vice president, partner, and China service leader from Kidney Matthews. This panel will be moderated by Mark Carlin. Ms. Carlin has 30 years of experience in the commercial real estate investment business. He was the, invest, he was the executive managing director of CBRE Global Investors and president and founder of the firm Strategic Partners Asia Fund, where he led the fund's dedicated investment team with offices in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, Tokyo, and Singapore. Previously, he was the president, CEO, and the founder of Imperial Credit Commercial Mortgage Investment Corporation, a publicly traded real estate investment trust that invests in both commercial real estate and commercial mortgage loans in the U.S. In, and the Europe. Mr. Carlin earned his MBA, Juris Doctor, and Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard University, and currently he is teaching real estate finance and investment at UCLA. So now let's warmly welcome our moderator and panelists. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming. Let me uh, first say how proud I am to be sitting here with this distinguished panel, and uh, thank you for the terrific introduction. Uh, forgive me, I'm going to try to angle more. I don't want my back to you. Uh, I'd like to add a few extra words about our panelists because they have collectively a tremendous skill set uh, covering, I think, almost all aspects of the real estate business, from the advisory, investing, developing, finance, construction, development, they've done it all. Uh, to my immediate left, uh, Ting Ting Tan, you heard is the managing director for Beijing Construction's U.S. operations, where he's, she is in charge of their business operations in the United States. Uh, Beijing Construction, as some of you know, is a 60-year-old state-owned company in China. Its business spreads across various industries, including construction, design build, and real estate development and investment. They have an international presence in more than 27 countries, including Africa, Asia, North and South America, that includes the United States and Canada and the United Kingdom. And they're consistently rated as one of the world's top contractors. Their US business started in 2007, and they currently focus their operations in the United States in Southern California, Texas, and Florida. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Feng Feng, to, your, to her, Ting Ting's immediate left, is uh, the co-founder and managing partner of the LA-based U.S. China Real Estate Investment Center. He's a seasoned architect and has assisted real estate developers in providing design solutions as well as solving their problems through different phases of the development process. Feng graduated from the Dalian University of Technology in China with a bachelor's degree in architecture. He then went to the U.S. in the early 1990s to continue his study in architecture at the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, where he received his master's degree in 1996. Fung is a licensed architect in California, a member of the American Institute of Architects, and you'll hear more about 
his business activities. To Fong's immediate left, we are pleased to have Wei Huang. Wei Huang is manager of acquisitions for LT Global Investments, Inc. LT Global was established in 2013 as the US subsidiary of the LT Commercial Real Estate Group Limited. Huang has 10 years of real estate experience that includes a wide range of projects, including urban landfill, planned unit developments, destination resorts, brownfield redevelopment, lead development, historical preservation, and mixed use projects. She's familiar with various real estate investment tools and development strategies and has international real estate experience that includes China, Europe, and the US. She has a unique multidisciplinary background in design, development, and finance, and she holds a master's degree from Harvard University in real estate and urban development, another master's degree in landscape architecture from USC, and her bachelor's degree from Tongji <laughs> University in Shanghai. Thank you for being here, very impressive. And last but not least, uh, to your left, at the end of the panel, Skip Whitney. Skip is a native of San Francisco, and he founded his namesake firm, Whitney Crestman Limited, in 1974. It's a real estate investment advisory firm that focuses on both commercial leasing and domestic and international property sales. In addition to Skip's work with US clients, He's consistently been successful in advising giants from Asia, including Chong Hong Kong, China, and Southeast Asia, regarding their property investment interests and activities, particularly on the west coast of the US. In 06, Skip helped engineer a merger of his firm with Kidder Matthews, where he is now executive, managing, uh, executive vice president and a partner with the firm. He leads Kidder Matthews' China services business, which is one of the only China-focused cross-Pacific real estate groups in the US offering advisory, brokerage, and property management services to Chinese companies who are looking to invest in the US. So you can see we have a group of true experts, and I am looking forward to the panel. So let me kick it off with the first question. With all of the interest from China investing in the US property markets, what segments do each of you think are the most opportune or the best risk-adjusted returns is it the office, retail, residential, industrial, or lodging, or perhaps lifestyle? Are there different geographic regions that you have preferences for across the US, east, south, west? Is it core type investment deals with low risk and low return, or are they the more development related opportunistic deals? What makes your investment mind excited? And why don't we start to my left? Ting Ting, I'm going to tee it off with you. OK, thank you. Um, well, I think that it's really different from um, people to people and uh, deal to deal. But generally, as our company, we start a business in uh, California. You know, the reason that nice weather here, large Chinese community, and also a gateway city Perfect. to China, you know. And uh, this gives an opportunity that uh, no one knows better probably than ourselves that what we want and what we need. And um, also, like Texas, the business, the first business we started in Texas, Houston, we focus on the medical care business and medical real estate development. Um, in uh, in uh, Florida, Miami area, we more focus on the hotel business. So it's really depending the location and what is the most attractive there and what is the main character of this uh, region or city, you know. So uh, we are a general contractor, our first majority job. And in the recent year, we start our business in real estate. So uh, as a state-owned company background, we try to balance, you know, the risk and profit. We're not looking for very high returns in this marketing, but we try to balance the risk. And we consider that because the U.S. market here is more you know, regulated uh, matured. So that is our basic strategy, and we set up a long-term relationship with the local partners, and mm -hmm. uh, we want to um, be a resident, but not just a visitor here. Fantastic. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, particularly your company's illustrious background. Fang, how would you approach that question? Well, um, <clears throat> I think there's no secret that Chinese investors, um, they prefer these gateway cities, um, and also, um, you know, probably, probably has to do with uh, um, I, most of them, I think, of coming from their own, own perspective, their own experience um, doing projects in China. And they prefer uh, 
gateway markets and also large scale projects. Um, because that was supposedly a, a proven strategy in China. So um, I think it's natural for them to, to consider these gateway markets in the United States as well. Um, but f as a investment advisor, um, I think we see opportunities beyond these markets. And I think our challenge is really try, trying to, um, how to communicate uh, with our investors and uh, try to make them, make them understand where true values are, are, are lying and, and why we're making um, decisions beyond what their preferences are. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, we can speak to this a bit more uh, as we go on. Perfect. Uh, Juan? Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting because I just re uh, read a recent uh, report from CBRE. Uh, during 2014, uh, New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, uh, three cities accounted about 77% uh, of the Chinese investment in commercial real estate in, in the United States. So obviously, those cities mm -hmm. um, grabbed the first wave of the China, China money. But I totally agree with uh, my panels here. Um, it really different from company to company, whether uh, which city to go. Like for, for example, LT Global, we are fairly new in the US market. We established in 2013, so we start from Los Angeles. We focus in Southern California. And with our background in, uh, in China, we are more focused in uh, retail development, and we do have experience and the resources in China for retail development, so we started from there. So that's our choice, and especially uh, with our long-term plan in the United States, uh, retail and uh, um, com I mean commercial real estate with development, um, it meets our long-term target. So that probably is a little bit different from um, some other uh, investors who is more interested in the residential, so it's faster for um, buy and sell. Fantastic. Skip, how do you look at it? So I, one of your questions was which segment of the market? So which? I think my panelists covered where. Mm -hmm. I think uh, our issues are being driven by our clients and what they want to do, and then our responsibility is to direct them in opportunities that we think that are best suited. I think one of the questions was, is it core? Is it lifestyle? Is it development? Um, I don't want to jump ahead, but I believe that all those are very interesting for our clients. We pre predominantly work in areas in Northern California. We're working with projects down here. We've gone to the extent of even being involved in, we recently involved in a major transaction with clients you've probably heard by the name of Oceanwide, who has the big LA Live project here <coughs> in uh, Los Angeles. We have just purchased a large resort for them in San Francisco, up in the wine country. And they're taking it upon themselves to find a lifestyle is something that we can talk about because they want to do something that's different and go into areas where other markets are. So my role and our role in working with other clients is to try, trying to direct them where everybody isn't. Fantastic. Is that more of a contrarian approach or is it really just following your investors because they are, after all, where the, the capital tells you what, you what they want? I just want them to make money. Okay. <laughs> Great so answer. I just try to help them make money in areas where everybody isn't. Love it. Um, help me understand, uh, for, for those of you, uh, Ting Ting and Huang, you developers, and I guess in your case, investors, and Fang, you and Skip, uh, with the fund and investors yourselves, you all face challenges when you're uh, bringing Chinese investment capital uh, into the U.S. How do you approach those challenges? And what are the most significant challenges that you face in your segment of the business? Are they, are they regulatory? Uh, are they cultural? Uh, are they deal specific? Um, currency and tax? All of the above. How do you approach the question? Maybe we'll reverse the order and Skip give you the first shot. Well, since I'm the only Westerner up here, let me tell you from my perspective. And uh, it's a challenge. It's really a, a big effort and it's become less of an effort over the years, but um, right now people are starting to finally get that it's important to have somebody on the ground. As I was talking to our colleagues here earlier, I call it China 2.0 because up until recently there was a number of, uh, the Chinese would come in, they'd parachute in, they'd parachute out. And you know, they think that they can do the business here in the United States, and please forgive me my panelists, but they try to do business here in the United States the way they try to do business in China. 
and it's, it's really a cultural difference. And candidly, you know, our panelists here represent the change, the change that everybody here is Chinese, everybody here is on the ground, and everybody's working collectively to try to help their partners or their advisors or their principals to be successful here. So I, I fundamentally, from my perspective, it's, it's a cultural difference, and um, it's a long conversation, so I don't want to take too much time, and we can talk about it later as it comes up. Fantastic, great answer. Long challenges that you sure, face, and yeah, how do you address them? Yeah, I think them? it's a complicated combination of a little bit of everything. Um, the local law, local um, financing, local market, um, local networking, um, connections, everything is new for the uh, Chinese investors. Um, and uh, I think for, for us as, as LT Global, we are very lucky because we, we, uh, we got everyone in our office is local hire. And I guess that's part of the reason why we moved a little bit faster than some of the, uh, the other um, um, Chinese investors here. So we can make quick decisions and we are familiar with local market and uh, we are familiar with, uh, we got, of course we got help from uh, uh, local consultants as well. Um, and uh, our parent company trust us and uh, uh, they trust us, uh, our decisions and uh, trust our uh, local knowledge. And um, it, it, it being a great help for us to be able to get deals done quickly. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Fung, how do you approach all these challenges? I, I think, you know, local conditions aside, um, I think really the, what I see the biggest challenge in facing Chinese investors um, is that really the lack of understanding of how, how the real estate market here operates. Because um, most of the investors tend to base their sometimes decisions, you know, most time decisions on their experiences um, and or knowledge and knowledge of the Chinese market. Um, so I think for us as advisors, I think really the communication is, is, is the key. Um, trying to help them understand, you know, what really, what, what investment really are, 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 are good, which, which ones are, are not so good, even, even, even based on their own, own experiences, they thought were sound opportunities. Um, and secondly, I think, you know, uh, we, you know, panelists talk about relying on local teams, local talents. Um, but um, what's more important is, is, is how the, wh who gets to make the decisions. I mean, whether the, the people on the ground here have enough authority to make those decisions or it all have to go back to China. Um, so I think that's, that, that can make a very big difference. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. Ting -ting, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, I think that local know-how is really crucial. And uh, you need to know that uh, how the business are conducted here, how the people think here, how the things could be done here, not just uh, you know, according to your earlier experience. Um, so that's uh, really the most important thing. And also, I think that uh, find the right partner will probably be one of the good way to be success. But the difficult and challenging is how to identify <laughs> this is the right exactly. partner, right? So that's really, at BCEG, we spent um, almost uh, seven years until now in the US. So um, I think that uh, it needs your patient and uh, need your, start your first case to learn from the real job. So that's the things I want to, you know, mention. And I, I think Ting Ting brings up a great point, and that's trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and that's then right. the most yes. important point is the trust in the relationships. And, you know, all of you, a lot of you students, there's a great opportunity for you because you're here. And, you know, there's a generational gap between um, people here because the people in the room now have the opportunity to be the trusted advisors and family friends of the people who are doing business in China, mm -hmm. where a lot of us at this, a lot of us here didn't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese really want to try to do business here, but the factor of how to trust one another and how to get trust, the Western <laughs> culture, the Western way of doing business, the Western lifestyle, that, that takes time. But mm -hmm. in this market, we don't ha they don't have time because the market's gonna pass them up. Exactly. So I think, you know, throwing that I, open. Yeah, one more point that I think um, 
as our position, we will land me, you know, myself. Our position now actually is more important to be a coordinator sometimes. Mm -hmm. You need to bring your trust to your Beijing headquarters, Shanghai headquarters, you know. So this communication is very important because they trust your team here according to your presentation. Mm -hmm. So that would maybe a very important job and also if you can bring this kind of the trust, you can really shorter the whole procedure to approve, you know, the things right. that are moving forward. Right. right. Very difficult job sometimes, I, I believe. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, there's, there's one more, uh, I think it's also a very big challenge is that the business cultures of the two countries are very different. Mm -hmm. And in China, um, it's, it's well known that, that, that business are, businesses are usually, deals are made just with a handshake. It's not so in the, in the, in the United States. Yeah. And if it's not on the paper, then if you want to want something, want ask for something, then it's, um, you know, there's going to be negotiations involved. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Chinese businesses, companies are, are learning that, just starting to learn mm -hmm. that. Um, so I think that there's, that major difference here is, is actually, I think, sometimes a, a fairly big hurdle mm -hmm. for Chinese companies as well. I hear the word trust and partnership, and uh, it reminds me of my experience when I ran a fund focused on China. I was the opposite direction, a Western investor investing in China, and how we had to, from 2007 through 2011, vet the various partners in China that we were going to do business with. And the number one issue wasn't necessarily experience or track record. It was, can you trust your partner? And then experience and track record and skill is absolutely essential. So uh, I think you're all looking at the right issues. Let me focus the next, two, uh, next question on our two um, uh, panelists who are uh, focused on development, and then we'll s give a little uh, question to our other two panelists. So with the challenges that developers face generally, and now there are other challenges because you're in a foreign market for the most part, are there non-economic reasons that motivate you as developers to do business here in the US, for example, uh, Beijing Construction might want to develop and expand its brand image, even if it doesn't make a lot of money on the deal, and the value of that from a marketing perspective might have, uh, might have a significant non-economic benefit. Perhaps learning new or best practices from partners that you trust here uh, on leasing and management and development. Perhaps there's a skill set uh, that can be learned here. Are those um, elements things that you uh, think about? Uh, as developers here. Uh, Huang, maybe you can approach that? Yeah, uh, I think especially for LT, our, with our strategic uh, global uh, plan, uh, as a, from the corporate level, it is very important that for us to build our brand uh, in the local market. And because uh, uh, we do plan to stay here for a long time. And uh, we understand how that important it is um, to build the local uh, reputations here in the communities. Um, so, uh, in, other than doing our investment and uh, development here on the real estate side, we do involve a lot in the local, uh, local communities uh, to try to invest ourselves to be part of the community here, to help to build our reputations in, in the United States. Um, and that will help us, our business in the long run. Uh, for example, we, we just uh, sponsored a uh, cherry blossom fest festival in one of our properties in uh, West Comina. And we worked with the city and the nonprofit organization in the city to promote um, the Asian culture to uh, local communities. Uh, and we are now planning another event uh, working with the city to uh, help with the Special Olympic. And mm -hmm. in that case, um, we're, we're helping the, uh, the local cities to promote the American culture to, to, the, to the Special Olympic people, their team Japan, they're, this, uh, hosting, uh, they're hosting team Japan in West Covina. So we're introducing the American culture to, to, the, to the visitors. Mm -hmm. So we're doing this, try to be, uh, make ourselves be, be part, to be part of the community and uh, um, get support and hear the, uh, listen to the needs to our uh, city and the, the people there. So and eventually it helped us to grow here in the United States. 
Very interesting. Thank you. Ting Ting, any uh, comments? Uh, yeah, my answer would be yes or no. <laughs> yeah. Perfect answer. <laughs> yeah, because that uh, every investor, you know, came into a new marketing, of course, they're looking for a profit. Yeah, that's for true. The only thing is that uh, we need reminders, you know, you're looking for a short term or long term. What's mm -hmm. your perspective here, you know, and um, um, for our, like our company, when in the beginning we do the general contractor, right? So we need, it's definitely, you need to allow you have a period to learn the things, you know. So um, we're not looking for that, okay, we, we, we lose the money but to get the job. But mm -hmm. what we, we're looking for is that probably a lower, you know, a lower profit but to have a good partner and good project and good to learn. So mm -hmm. basically, this is our, you, you know, my point. A good approach, smart. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, let me address the, this question of Fong and Skip. Um, as Chinese investors uh, yourselves and advisors to Chinese investors, uh, and as more confidence is gained uh, by the investment community uh, investing in the US, do you think you or your um, clients will start looking beyond the gateway cities uh, and the prime asset strategies to say secondary US cities and to perhaps higher risk return um, investment strategies to move beyond the low risk return, say the low hanging fruit? How do you think that's gonna play out over time? Well, again, I think, you know, I think we addressed that before by, you know, there, there are different, it, it all depends on the, uh, where the investors are coming from, what they're looking for. Um, currently, we're working for some uh, rather large institutional investors in China. So really, they're, they're really looking beyond the, the location, the, 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 the sort of the, you know, the, they're really looking beyond the shiny objects, in a, in a, in a, in, to put it short, uh, simple, simply. Um, so they're really paying more attention to the underlying asset and the potential um, and of, of the asset mm -hmm. as, as well. So uh, going to the fundamentals, um, in other words. Um, so how does that relate to city, prime versus secondary? Um, there is still a preference um, for these, primes, these primary cities. Um, but I think, again, um, it, it's, it's really our job to help them to see beyond those, those markets. Okay. So right now, our strategy is, is a very national strategy. Fantastic. And I ask, because I think, Huang, you pointed out that the CBRE report recently said that more than three quarters of Chinese investment capital is investing in three cities, right? New York, mm -hmm. San Francisco, and LA. And that's, we all know that. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of other, even first tier cities. You know, you've got Chicago, it's not even in the mix. What do you think, Skip? Should there be a broader focus on distributing assets and capital around the country or just follow the interest today and see where it goes tomorrow? I think you have to follow the transactions and I think you have to have good partners in each one of those cities before you're making an investment. And I think that I want to just step back a bit about your question earlier about risk. I think there's a lot of risk that's being taken right now, like her company, with you know, going in and not having an entitlement. And what I'm finding is right now in real estate, there's a lot of press about people buying, you know, trophy core properties, but there's a lot of prop companies right now that are stepping out of a safety zone and they're actually buying large blocks of land where they can go forward with no permits and take entitlement risk and hmm. develop projects on their own rather than following it the way everybody else has been doing it. I mean, we're working with a group up in San Francisco for the first time. It's building a 300, about a 38-story project, 350-unit mixed-use hotel. And they, in San Francisco, it's been very challenging to get permits, but they're still willing to take that risk to go forward because of the opportunity, with location being San Francisco. Okay. So, uh, I, I get you. So, so the risk is actually um, within the particular market, San Francisco, which is a highly desired market for all investors, including Chinese But Anaheim. they're finding they're finding their higher risk return by chasing elements of the deal, like entitlements that others might or might not be comfortable with. Correct. Fantastic. Let's talk about another element of risk, uh, since I teach a finance class. Let's talk about interest rates. And interest rates globally have been incredibly low, at their all-time lowest level in history, and for a number of years since the global tsunami, economic tsunami hit. And uh, rates are supposed to be low for another year or two, 
uh, but the Fed, U.S. Federal Reserve and other central bankers are hinting rates may rise. They'd like rates to rise at some point in the future. Do you worry about interest rates and how does the capital side of the equation um, play into your investment strategy and thinking? Let me jump in on, from my view, since under advisory, I hope the interest rates raise because then the Chinese are going to have greater opportunities in the market. Because right now, we're facing competition with all the domestic investors. Mm -hmm. And in my career over the past 35 years of doing business, the best opportunities were in a down market. And given the long-term diversification that Chinese investors have and the wealth that they have, that the coming into the market where they're invited, rather than having to compete with everybody else, mm -hmm. will be a greater opportunity. So I, I think the Chinese investors a lot that we work with are looking for long term beyond this cycle and then the next cycle. So if the interest rates go up, I'm probably going to make more money. Uh, I think that's a great insight. Uh, anybody else want to comment on that? <laughs> yeah, I think for, for us, actually, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question because it is part of our considerations uh, for, for, uh, for the interest rate uh, compared to the interest rate in China now and the interest rate in the, in the United States, the financing cost for development here in the U.S. is so cheap. Mm -hmm. So that, I, I, be, I believe that is part of the reason for a lot of the, uh, the, the Chinese investors now um, seeking opportunities in the, in the United States. But I believe eventually once the, they, the interest rate here going back and the China interest rate going down and the, eventually there is a balance there. But uh, um, we, we still see um, it well going on for a while. I personally don't see, uh, don't think they, they, they are paying much attention to the, uh, the potential interest rate rise. They're still looking at very low interest rate as of now. Um, I mean, that's a very good question. I mean, but on the other side of, you know, I think their desire to enter this market is, is uh, I think it's much stronger than the concerns of the interest rate rise. Thank you. Do you have a comment on interest rates? <laughs> well, I think that uh, instead of the interest rate only, we think about more on the uh, economic cycle. Yeah. Um, because that, uh, um, a lot of the Chinese investors actually are currently experiencing the uh, uh, economic cycle on the real mm -hmm. estate market in, China, in China's domestic real estate. So we more take care of about these things when we make the decision. Mm -hmm. And probably on the interest rate, I think for the individual investor needs to think about more about that. Because especially for the condo or senior housing for sale, per, uh, the project for sale, mm -hmm. that probably will have more effect on that portion. But for a company standing on a long term you know, uh, point of view, mm -hmm. um, probably not so. Right. I completely agree, except that if uh, your company uh, or the investment strategy you have is to build a project where the end result or the exit is to sell those units to individuals, if interest rates rise and individuals can't buy them, then the product you built is not going to sell well. So it still yeah. affects you. Yeah. Yeah. But, so but you know, one of the clients I'm working with in San Francisco, and this is San Francisco and may not characterize the rest of the United States, they're looking down the cycles because in San Francisco there's a limited demand, there's a limited amount of property that can be built. Limited supply limited supply. And so they're looking at, say, so okay, if we don't make this cycle, we can have them at condominiums. Can't, if we can't have them at condominiums, so be it. We'll just rent them out and we'll wait until the next cycle. So I, I think, you know. It depends on your market. San Francisco is very tightly supply constrained. <laughs> right. So you have a good opportunity. Um, actually, since we're talking about cycles, I think that's a great segue into a question um, that I've been thinking and that so many others have written about. Of course, in the Chinese market, you're all Partly here because the um, cycle in China from a real estate perspective feels a little bit more bubbly than we are comfortable with. And there's a concern there might be more downside than upside in the Chinese real estate market. And the U.S. market seems like it's a safer place in some respects. And yet, with all the new capital coming in from China, billions and billions of dollars, is there a parallel we might draw to the experience uh, 25 or so years ago in the 1980s when uh, enormous amounts of capital came from Japan to gateway cities in the US and bid up prices for properties in San Francisco and New York and in Los Angeles, only to see that bubble burst in the US and property values crash in the early 1990s. Uh, probably always fell 30 or 
And then a lot of the Japanese investment firms, literally some of them went bankrupt and they pulled up stakes and they all went back home and there isn't that much of a presence anymore. Is there any parallel to be drawn or do you think it's a completely different experience and we, we don't have much to learn from that time frame? I don't think, I don't think it's a comparable experience. Because if you look at the assets in LA, core properties, and you look at San Francisco, and even New York, the Chinese aren't the ones that are getting the headlines for paying the premium prices. They are in hospitality when it comes to hotels, mm -hmm. like they did with um, the Backrack Hotel or the Waldorf Wisteria. Mm -hmm. That's one issue. But I don't know if anybody in the panel or anybody in the room can pick a building downtown LA that was overpaid by a Chinese investor. You certainly can't do it in San Francisco. And part of that has to do with the ability to compete with the US. U.S. institutional money because of the fact you're being institutional, you know what I'm talking about, the inside, be able to get the product, get it, and understand the market, going back to the cultural mm -hmm. difference of what Fong Fong was saying, and be able to have the quick response. It's a very long answer to your question. But, but it's a good answer. Uh, <laughs> in terms of the relative risk reward of the Chinese property market compared to the U.S. market, any thoughts on that today? Should, should Chinese investors be moving more money to the U.S., or is there something to be concerned about here? <laughs> I, I think there's, there's really a lack of uh, options from, 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 from their perspective, because um, they're certainly not comparable with, 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 the, uh, with all the eggs in China. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are, are looking to diversify and reallocate and uh, you know and uh, in their mind US is still the top safe haven. Yeah, yeah I would say that too because um, compared to everywhere else in the world uh, the entire US mar market is still a uh, more like safe place uh, in the real estate especially the real estate uh, industry is uh, very um, transparent here in the in in the US, United States and the properties are uh, the liquidity level of the properties are pretty high, so uh, it's it's much easier for the foreign uh, investors to start mm -hmm. in the United States compared to a lot of the other countries. So if they seek a place to um, diversify their investment in the in, from Ch in China, uh, the US would be still a very good choice. Right. So I, I think the fear was that fear you know say if they their asset in China may may shrink. Um, at a much rapid speed than putting money here, right? So mm -hmm. even if you you lose some money in, in you know in the, in the, in the if you hit a down downturn here, I, I still think that's that's a better choice than than the money the yeah. money in China and, and and also looking looking at looking at the world worldwide, I I think they still pick U.S. over right. any other market. Right. Exactly, and uh, I think it's a nature of needs. Because uh, China, you know, um, after almost uh, two decades of very high speed growth of the um, economic, so a lot of the companies becoming strong and powerful and uh, cash rich. So it's the nature that those companies are looking for an opportunity on the international marketing. And the U.S. definitely, in a long time, are uh, um, enjoy the, the reputation of being fair, open, matured, and regulated. So it is one of the best choice for Chinese investor. But the, I, I saw the number of the CBRE too, you know. Um, China, Chinese uh, investment compared with other countries like Canada, uh, German, or mm -hmm. uh, um, Switzerland, still a smaller portion, you know, um, as the, um, um, as the investment amount. But especially when you think China is a uh, country like uh, over half over 1.3 million people and uh, world's second largest uh, in economic. So I believe this number will keep going, mm -hmm. yeah. I, w I just want to throw another comment in. I think the other thing is you need to step back and look at the amount the government is doing to support the inward bound investment. And I think that's, you know, with it, they've opened up the immigration now with 10 year multiple visas. They got five year student visas. They've opened up the increase from 50,000 to, I think, 2 million. They've encouraged government, estate owned enterprises, and companies to come in. So I think that is another part of this question that needs to be addressed as well. That's a great comment. You just answered one of my questions, Skip. So there's only a few minutes left, and I'm going to do something that, well, 
we'll see how it works. Um, so many of you are here because we have this remarkable, skilled, experienced, talented speaker panel. And what I'm going to ask each of you to do now, with the few minutes we have left, is to share with our audience the one secret that you would offer to them on how they can be successful investing in the U.S. real estate market. What would you have them do? <laughs> Unscripted, and it's raw. <clears throat> Who would like to go first? Skip, you just got anointed. So what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> not, not your concern. <laughs> You know, I, look at You can't I, take the Fifth Amendment. Okay, look at I've been doing this for 35 years and working in China and Hong Kong. I went to China the first time since 1982. I mean, it really boils down to finding the right partner who you can work with, building the relationship, having a plat uh, the proper platform here to be able to have the ability to execute and work with professionals, whether it be bankers, whether it be lawyers, whether it be tax advisors, putting together the right team together and have a partner that believes in you and you being able to have the ability, as Feng Feng says, to be able to execute and not be hogtied by what you know, things are going on. And I think a lot of you young student, younger people in the, comp in, the, in, the, in the audience have that opportunity that generations before you didn't have. And I think you should take advantage of the relationships you have back in China, find the right partner, and see what you can do. Okay, uh, Juan? Yeah. Uh, What's your secret sauce? <laughs> There's really no secret, I would say. Yeah, I guess um, for, for in, in terms of investment strategies, really different from person to person in, in terms of how, how much risk everyone can take on. Um, and uh, uh, some people can take on, uh, can afford higher risk, and so they can invest in some like secondary markets. Some people are, um, can afford uh, lower risk, but they can they can agree to lower returns, so they, they choose a more mature market. Um, so, and I, I believe that's the same same thing for everywhere, anywhere else um, um, for real estate investment. It, so, I, for me, there's really not a lot of secret here. Probably the one one of the fundamental thing I want to say is probably our first, uh, like the teachers tell us in our first real estate class. The secret for the real estate is three things. First, location. Two, second, location. And third, location. So that's all. You took my class. <laughs> you just got an A. Yeah. Fung, is there anything more to say than that? You know, I, I think if you're, you know, uh, I don't know what you are, your background is, um, but if you aspire to become an invest, invest, investment advisor, um, I think you should, probably should take advantage of your knowledge of this market, and hopefully you have the, a good knowledge of how Chinese market works, and try to be the best communicator you can be. Hmm. I mean, that's, I think that's really important, because just help Chinese investors understand this market and help them make the right decisions. Perfect. Ting Ting, you get the last word. <laughs> what is your secret? General contractors have a lot of secrets, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think that uh, um, be the residents, not just a visitor. Try to build your local team, try to understand local how, and open your mind, build up your trust and communication with your team here and your back home. Because um, you're, like we always saying that uh, when you're in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? So we're in the U.S., so we do as the U.S. regulation here. Yeah. Fantastic. So I'm going to summarize. Um, find a good partner. Remember, it's all about location because it is real estate. <laughs> the fundamentals matter, and they're not different here than they are abroad. Uh, and you must be physically present if you're going to succeed. And really what I take from that is that you can do it too. And so with that, I'll say thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Got a great panel. Thank you.